Okay, well, I'll just launch off here. Um, try to keep under time on my slot. Um, my name's June. I, uh, when I was asked to do this talk earlier in March, um, before it was canceled, I was actually a front-end software engineer at Grubhub. Um, shout out to uh, my former coworkers at Grubhub. Thank you for coming. Um, I worked on the restaurant side of the business there. Um, now I'm actually a software engineer at Google, um, and so I work on the search front-end for the G Suite apps. So a few months ago, I built an online web app for me and my friends to play Rummy 500, um, even though we were you know, not at the same place. And I used this React Firebase TypeScript stack that I think is a really great stack for a lot of developers to use on their own projects. Um, I'll be going over a description of the what and the why to start, and then we'll dive right into some interesting lessons learned and advice I have for, for users of the stack. So we'll do a quick overview of the technologies involved here. Um, I don't really think I need to speak much about React um, to this audience, so we'll skip that over. Um, but Firebase, some of you may have used already, some of you may not have heard of it. Um, it's this backend as a service, or you might have heard of it as infrastructure as a service um, provided to us by Google. Um, it really quickly allows you to set up and interact with services you might need for a project, such as a database, file storage, authentication, crash data, analytics. Um, it's got a bunch of stuff you can kind of pick and choose what you need to, to provide uh, essentially a, almost a complete backend to your front end. Um, really comes with a nice, clean, understandable API. Uh, the docs are filled with lots of good examples, so highly, highly recommended. Uh, most of you have probably already heard about TypeScript in some manner, shape, or form. Um, and overall, I briefly mentioned it. Uh, some of you may be already using it. Um, it's Microsoft's increasingly popular typed version of JavaScript, and it's a superset of JavaScript. So it means you, know, you can intermingle JavaScript with TypeScript, which is really nice for existing projects that are not in TypeScript. Um, it's got a lot of type inference, meaning uh, there's some things that you just don't have to write. It kind of figures out on its own. Um, if you have IDEs that have nice integration with TypeScript, it's really easy to make um, you know, your own types and, and kind of autocomplete API signatures, things like that. So it makes things really easy. Um, before I go forward, a quick disclaimer. I'm not going to talk about any of the component libraries or the CSS solutions um, that I use for the sake of focus and you know, for sake of time. I'm happy to discuss that with anyone individually if you want to ask questions about that. Um, please reach out, but that won't be the focus today. All right, so what does this stack actually give us? Uh, one of the biggest things, I think, the advantage of this stack is, is just how fast you can get from zero to production. Um, Firebase makes it super easy to set up. You know, a lot of like the command line tools, you just run a command, um, it's kind of set up for you. If you don't use the command line tools, the console UI is really good. Um, it's easy to scale if you ever take your application or your personal project to the point where you need to do that. You can do that pretty easily on the, on the UI console they have as well. Um, on the TypeScript side, set up once again, if you use Create React App, super easy. Um, they include a TypeScript option now that comes with a really nice default template. So you don't have to think about it too much, um, especially if you add ESLint on top of that and like a nice IDE like Visual Studio Code that supports all these features. Um, you really can just start. Like you can just type a few commands and just go. Um, and then, you know, you're, you're really like um, getting to a point where you're writing logic really quickly. Next is front-end focus. Um, Firebase is a go-to choice for many developers because it's easy to set up. And, and um, also, on top of that, it's well-designed and well-documented. Right? For the most part, and especially if you use the hooks, which I'll get to later, but um, for the most part, you can really just bar worry about writing your front-end logic instead of any of the data interaction layer, or anything like that you would normally have to do. Um, so super nice to use Firebase in that way. Same thing about authentication also. like. Um, a lot of uses of Firebase come to Firestore, which is the real-time database that I'll be talking about in more depth in a bit. But they also provide an authentication solution that makes it really easy and fast for you to um, allow that as part of your app. Um, on the TypeScript end, you know, focus meaning you can focus on your business logic instead of worrying about trivial things like which fields does this object have again. Like these are all things that you know you won't ever have to worry about once you start using TypeScript because it's kind of auto-suggested for you. Um, 
A note about security. So obviously I'm not a security expert, but uh, I know that a lot of people, especially like me, who just want to like get something out there, um, don't really want to have to worry about all the details. They want something secure that just works, right? And the auth part of, of uh, Firebase kind of takes care of that for you. Not only do they take care of the auth part, they literally give you a built-in UI um, that you can just drop into your application. And um, all you have to do is subscribe to a user's login logout event and everything else is kind of taken care of for you. Um, super nice. Um, I'll get back to that more later, but um, highly recommended. And on the database side, the security rules that Firestore kind of allows you to write on the on your console um, makes it super easy to specify who's allowed to access which parts of your st uh, storage. So super helpful in that manner. And last but not least, uh, tons of resources out there um, for both Firebase and TypeScript. They're pretty popular choices now, so it gives us a wealth of you know existing Stack Overflow questions, docs, examples. So. Just like React, both of these um, tools have a pretty strong community. All right, so let's uh, look at the actual app here. Um, what did I build? Well, I built an online version of Rummy 500, scoped it down to two players. Uh, if you've actually played Rummy 500, you know it's for multiple players, but this app is for two players only. Um, if you don't know what the card game is, very simple explanation. It's just a card game where you try to lay down the most valuable cards to gain more points than your opponent. Um, and the app itself, um, I use Firebase Auth UI, like I mentioned, to, to help authentication. Um, once users are logged in, they can send game requests to other users. And then um, once they accept that request, the game starts and you know everything about the game as well as the requests themselves are in real time thanks to the real-time nature of, of the Firestore storage. Um, here's my data model. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to really not dwell on this too much. If you're interested, um, feel free to ask questions, or you know, I think these slides will be hopefully made available um, somehow after the presentation, so feel free to take a look at it. But I'm just going to slide over that for now. And to get to the interesting part, um, so now for the lessons learned and the interesting tips. So using TypeScript with React is not at all a language, or in fact, learning a new framework even. Uh, many people think that they have to learn a whole new set of syntax, but that's really not true. Um, especially now with hooks and like really great type inferences, um, you, you really don't have to veer too much from the JavaScript you already know. Um, if you've never written any type languages before, you might have to learn a little bit of type syntax, but you know, it's, it's not too difficult. And especially if you have um, experience with typed languages with Java, like you'll, you'll really hit the ground running. Um, one added benefit of this is that it'll help you get better at reading docs. So especially if you're just starting to come um, onto the React community or, you know, get more experience or want to get more experience, you know, docs are an important way to do that. And a lot of docs use typed languages and, um, or rather type syntax to kind of describe their API inputs and outputs. So really good skill to have. Um, all in all, I just want to stress that like, you really don't have to change your way of thinking, especially if you have tools like ESLint enabled, right? You just write the code. You usually write in JavaScript and kind of follow the lint rules and IDs, autocomplete suggestions, and you'll be surprised how quickly you can, you can get productive as, as a beginner to TypeScript. Kind of going off of that, um, make sure you pay attention to type errors, especially if you're learning TypeScript and kind of learning to use it with other tools. Um, I know at first these will probably annoy you a lot. <laughs> I, I know it did when I was first learning TypeScript. It was like, here are all the, these errors I'd never had to deal with writing JavaScript. You know? um, and some of them sounded verbose, some of them were confusing, but really don't let yourself off the hook um, about these errors. Don't use hacks to get around them because 99% of the time, these errors are telling you something important. And you know, this screenshot is kind of contrived, but you can kind of see that it, it is telling you exactly what's wrong, right? And like, um, if you take the time to dig in, Google around and ask about your errors, then, then more often than not, it's, you find that it's a common problem that TypeScript beginners have. And, you'll learn something really important from it. And as you do more of that, you know, your TypeScript will become to begin to um, be more informed and um, you'll start to catch bugs more easily, et cetera, et cetera. A few other TypeScript tips. 
Um, so there's these things called index signatures. So think that, you know, imagine you want to write objects that contain like dynamic keys, right? So for example, like you have an object that has user IDs as keys and then object, the values themselves are like other user objects that contain some information about the user. That's pretty common, I suppose. Um, the keys, so these user IDs would be called um, index signatures in TypeScript. And one thing about index signatures is that you can't have index signatures at the same level as other string fields in TypeScript, which is um, a little bit of a, of a bummer, but there's definitely a nice workaround, which as you can see kind of in my round data type that, that I've posted here, um, this UID string um, that you see is, a, is the example of an index signature that I'm talking about. So I couldn't put that right at the top level of the round data structure because the ID string field is already there. So um, a workaround that uh, is often done and is suggested is to just nest it under another string field. Um, gives you the added benefit of using another variable name to kind of describe what you're putting in there anyway. So um, another tip, don't be fast and loose with your nulls and undefines. I know a lot of people, for a lot of people, JavaScript kind of allows you to do that. And to some, it's kind of a strength, but TypeScript is kind of the opposite. The strength of TypeScript is forcing you and your code to be strict and meaningful, right? So make sure when you do allow null and undefines in your types that it holds some, some actual meaning, right? For example, you know, a, a null in your variable could, could mean a value is not yet loaded from an asynchronous call. Like that's a solid meaning, right? That is assigned to the null value. Um, be mindful of, of other API types that you pull in that also allow null and undefined. These can um, usually lead to bugs if you just assume that those won't ever happen. So um, that's another nice thing that if you pay attention to the types and be strict about them, it'll really help you catch those bugs. All right, now moving on to the Firebase side. So let's talk about hooks a little bit. Um, I don't know how many of you um, are familiar or like, I guess, have kind of used hooks in production or, or you know, just starting to get to know them or already an expert on hooks. I mean, I think people are kind of all over the place right now. Um, but there's definitely, you know, some, some positive momentum toward hooks as a community, especially. And um, I think more often than not, you know, you're going to want to write these hooks, um, especially you're in, when you're interacting with um, APIs like Firebase, you know, you're going to want to write hooks that kind of pull data from Firestore, for example. Um, on that note, I would want to highly recommend everyone to do that yourself. So I found that writing Firestore hooks kind of helped me understand, you know, use state, use effect, the very basic bare bones of how hooks works and like what, you know, what is a hooks life cycle, quote unquote. I know that's probably not the appropriate word to use, but um, you know how to really manage and write your own hooks and uh you know doing that using firebase if you're interested in really understanding um how you should write hooks and, and the paradigms and the best practices then i would highly recommend doing that yourself um, there's an article called a complete guide to use effect some of you guys might have already read it um it's by dan abramov and it is probably the best article you could read out there that explains um, how to use use effect which is I find that a lot of people, that's the hook that a lot of people have issues understanding. So if you haven't, I would definitely check it out. It's super long, but it's worth your time. Um, but if time is not what you have and you need a stack that will just get you to production as quickly as possible, then there's this really nice um, package, React Firebase hooks. So if you just Google React Firebase hooks, the first one that comes up, um, and the API is pretty great. Uh, it's straight, straightforward. And um, if you're short on time, that's the one I recommend using. So moving away from storage, let's talk about auth, right? So this is the part, again, that people usually want to just drop in, drop in and kind of forget about and let it work on its own, right? So um, on the left here, you see Firebase auth dropped into my app. Um, super basic, bare bones, because you know my app is kind of still MVP. But um, especially if your map or app is already kind of using design similar to material, it looks, you know, pretty, um, it looks pretty nice, uh, blends in well. And uh, in the middle here, you can see the actual demo of the, that Google posted themselves, um, listing like all the various sign-in providers. I think they have a lot more than this too, um, if you're looking for others. Um, but really like 
it just there's a react component that you can pull and you literally just prop, plop it in into your app and it looks like this and you can just go to the console like click which ones you want to provide to the users and that's all like that's all you have to do super nice um one tip use the react component that firebase provides don't use the um plain javascript component because that can get a little bit tricky with the life cycles and stuff so um i've linked here on the slide uh where that react component resides if you want to use that all right, uh, let's wrap up with a few other Firebase tips. So casting, um, TypeScript has, you know, casting like many other type languages. Um, you do, if you are writing your own Firestore hooks, you do need to cast your data uh, to the types that you're using on your front end when you pull them down. This can be a source of bugs because um, the Firestore default like data getter functions, they just return the type of any. So just make sure, you know, you've got the right types that when you're casting. Um, arrays in Firestore are kind of interesting. They're really the one and only pain point that I have that um, I really you know, wish was a little bit better in Firestore. Um, there are some restrictions. For example, you can't store arrays of arrays in Firestore. So for example, like say you have tuples, right? In TypeScript, that's just you know, JavaScript array underneath. So if you wanted to store an array of tuples in Firestore, you can't, which is kind of a bummer. Um, you can, there's a bunch of workarounds. So you can use like an object as a workaround. Um, the official docs kind of recommend, uh, you know, having objects where the field is like the string key, you know, that you need it to be. And then the value is just true. Um, I prefer writing, um, objects that have integers as keys, and then the values can be more than just strings. It can be complex objects that you need. Um, and then when you pull it down, you can just call object.values on that object, and that will turn it into an array. And you can kind of use all your favorite array methods and so on and so forth. So um, kind, of a, kind of sucks that you have to do a workaround that way. But um, for the most part, I found that you, know, you won't necessarily run into um, those issues. Uh, so not the, not the worst issue. Um, if order matters, I would also be careful with how you update your arrays in Firestore. So um, the built-in Firestore array update methods are kind of there to allow you to use arrays as sets, so kind of unordered collections. And if you, if you do care about the order of your arrays in Firestore, then you kind of have to manage those updates yourself. So I would be careful about doing that. And last but not least, uh, be organized about your functions that interact with Firebase, right? Um, it might be obvious to a lot of us if we've done a lot of development, but really you should be extracting all the Firebase-related logic into um, neat functions and kind of call them in your components as needed. Then that's where the hooks come in. Um, I would, for example, like keep the real-time update uh, Firestore functions separate from the functions that get value once. Um, this can be a real common source of bugs. If you're like calling some Firestore data and you're like, why isn't this updating? You realize you called the wrong function, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, keep them in separate files or even better, like establish a strict naming scheme for yourself. So like fetch versus subscribe, um, that can really, really help. Um, one last tip on the organization aspect. Uh, I would do all your Firebase initializations in one file and then have all that stuff like exported out of that file and then other Firebase code can import from there. And that will kind of help you avoid circular imports and kind of keep your initialization code running only once, which can be also another big source of bugs that a lot of people kind of try to use Firebase in React. So try to keep that in mind. All right. Um, there's a bunch of links that I want to share. There's you know really too many useful links that I can really fit on one slide, but this is kind of the pared down version. Um, I hope you got something useful and some good advice uh, out of that. And hopefully I kind of encourage those who haven't used this stack before to try it, uh, especially in your own project. And uh, yeah, I guess we can do questions.